This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Hello, welcome to Raising Me. This is where we take the challenges that we experience every day as parents right to the experts for advice. I'm Adrian Stein, a mom of three and an Emmy Award-winning journalist who frankly is just trying to figure this all out like you are. Today's episode is really just as much about raising kids and the pressure that they face as it is about reflecting on how we parent and even how we were raised. So we're talking to the author of The Disintegrating Student and this book, you know those books that just really hit you? This was one of them. There were so many relatable moments reading this where I was actually like reacting out loud with a, oh, yes, or, well, yep, that's me, that kind of thing. I read several parts to my husband even too, like this is so real. It was like getting called out, but in a good, you know, sort of self-realization kind of way. Let's get right into it because Dr. Janine Janot has so much important stuff to talk with us about. First, the achievement culture that we're living in from sports to education and the impact that that is having on our kids. And this term disintegrating student, the so-called smart kids who seem to kind of unravel as they get into higher grades. So why is this happening? And what can we as their parents and their caregivers or guardians, what can we do to help them? Plus, we're gonna talk about how our taking control of situations for our kids can really affect them. Even something simple like play dates. There are some really eye-opening realizations in this particular episode. So let's go ahead and get started. Dr. Juno, I got to tell you, I am so glad you're here. This topic is fascinating. And I think that whether you have a child who is struggling with this or not, we're going to have a conversation about parenting, too. It's just as much about the parents as it really is about the kids. So thank you for being here with us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Let's just get started with, you know, the kids we're really talking about here are the kids who probably excelled in early grades, like the, the quote unquote, the, the smart kids who things came easy and natural to them. But as they progress in into higher grades, coursework gets more challenging, they really start to struggle, if not fall apart. So talk to us a little bit, what are the characteristics of these particular kids to see if we can identify our own kids here? Absolutely. So I coined the term disintegrating student to describe these children because it just did. It felt like they all of a sudden fell apart and seemingly out of the blue. And where I noticed them was in my coaching practice. So students would come to me and I kept noticing these really bright, sometimes identified gifted children who never had any problems. And then all of a sudden they were really struggling. And what I came to realize is it was a lot of factors, but one of the main things was they, these kids had never had to put a lot of effort into learning. It came very, very easily to them. They had been told their whole life how smart they were. But when the rigor started to become increasingly more difficult for them, especially in those late middle school grades into high school, and sometimes it was even college before this would happen, they hit what I call a rigor tipping point. And at that point, because they had never developed the skills and the strategies and the habits that support learning in that way where you have to put some effort in, that is where they were hitting the wall. And then there was a, there's a whole bunch of other things that are tied into identifying as a smart kid and then starting to struggle like this. So that's where things really just start to fall apart for them. And of course, that's when parents take note. And when that starts to happen, when the parents starting to freak out a little bit that their A student is all of a sudden getting some C's or maybe worse, 
that's where miscommunication and misunderstandings start to happen in the family. Well, it starts to, it creates trust for the parents too, right? But let's let's talk first about the kids because part of being labeled a smart kid that becomes part of your identity, no matter what it is. Whenever you're told repeatedly, oh, you're such a smart kid. Oh, maybe it's, oh, you're such a funny kid, whatever it is. For these purposes, we're talking specifically academically. But when you're not rising to what is expected of you, even if you've put that own expectation on yourself, that self-esteem comes to mind for me is like that. And then it creates this cycle of feeling like low self-esteem, maybe there's some anxiety. Can you talk a little bit about just that identity and and the importance of keeping that in mind when we're talking about this with our children? Oh, it's a huge factor because I think as a parent, our first instinct is just to help. And once we help, it should be fixed. And we're not recognizing all these underlying factors within the child. Like you said, self-esteem starts to fall, confidence starts to fall. And what I learned is over the years, I don't know if your listeners would be familiar with Carol Dweck's concept of fixed and growth mindset, but basically these students, because they have heard for so many years how smart they are, how fast they do their work, all those kinds of positive, that positive praise they've been getting, they it does become a part of their identity. So when they start getting information, even in the, inconsistently that maybe I'm not as smart as I thought I was because now I'm starting to get these bad grades every once in a while, that's when they don't do the things that we as parents think that they would do, which is like try hard, harder, ask for help. They do kind of the opposite because they're self-protecting. They don't believe that they can be any smarter, that they've always thought they were as smart as they could be and now it's ending. And so because of that, they don't ask for help. They're embarrassed. They kind of struggle alone. They shy away from challenges because that's basically going to out them. Like, oh, that looks really hard. And if, I, if I'm getting information, I might not be able to do that kind of work. I just won't turn it in or I'll, I won't study. So they really start self-handicapping and self-sabotaging in a lot of ways which can really confuse parents. Procrastination comes to mind. Mm -hmm. It becomes an excuse. And they compare downward too. So they'll also look at their, you know, if they're not doing well, they'll they'll say, well, I might've gotten a 72, but so-and-so got a 68. So instead of striving, a person with a more growth mindset would look at and say, wow, I got a 72, but there were a bunch of people who got like 80s and 90s. What are they doing and how can I do it that way. So it's just a whole different mindset that they're bringing to school. And so many of our students today, so many fall into this kind of more, more to the fixed mindset side of um, operating in school. It's hard for parents to, to know what to do because, you know, you mentioned the rigor ticket tipping point and the, that happens, you, like you mentioned, sort of like what you're finding is middle school, was it eighth grade is one mm-hmm. potential year? Was it 10th grade? There were there were three specific grade levels yes. that you mentioned. So when I wrote the book, it was eighth grade, 10th grade, and that first semester of college seemed to be the times where I was really seeing st- students hit that rigor tipping point. In the subsequent years, and partly with COVID and the pandemic and all those things, I've seen it happens sooner. Um, and, and a lot of it is that the, you know, we're starting to see AP classes in middle school and we're seeing seventh and eighth graders taking high school level courses. So because of that, you know, they walk in as a freshman, they might be doing sophomore work and they Mm -hmm. do not have the maturity and the skills and the things necessary to be successful with that amount of rigor. I kind of want to talk about a few things. So let's talk about your book first and foremost, because you you mentioned The Disintegrating Student is the title of your book. I actually have it here in a few notes, <laughs> as you can see. Um, but I think what's really important about this concept is looking inward as parents. And it's not just how we're parenting our kids, but also how we were parented and how that impact. It, it's like this s- cycle. Uh, essentially happening. But one part that you dive into is just play is so much different from for kids today 
than it was, you know, back in the day when you might just go outside and and not come home until it's dark. Now kids are in a much more structured environment. Always school is more structured. Play is more structured. You have these play dates that are very intentional. They're set up by parents. Parents are usually around in some capacity. So how does that impact our kids today, particularly when it comes to the academic performance that we're, we're talking about? So it's actually had a really big impact because play in those early years in particular is how the brain grows and becomes kind of this massive learning machine. So the more you're upside down and running and and doing those kinds of things, it's incredibly beneficial to the brain and its development. So the more we have kids sitting, sitting either on games or devices or in chairs at school doing homework in kindergarten, those those are opportunities that are taken away from that movement and that play. And when we when we look at even a play date, sure, there may be some rough and tumble play and all that kind of stuff, but there's less of it because there's parents involved who are saying, wait, don't, don't do that. Wait, that's not safe. And we're kind of, we're inserting ourselves in a situation that historically, developmentally, kids have been able to handle themselves. And this is, this then kind of continues on into education where we are very much structuring almost everything our kids do. So autonomy for our children is really, really low. And by the time they get to high school, I see the, the negative side of that because there's so many kids who just lack that self efficacy, either the confidence or trust in themselves to do things or the desire because they've spent their whole life not really having to. So I I think it has this long-term impact that seems very innocuous when we're doing it and like, oh, we're doing a good thing. We're getting our kids out there and playing, but it's different. There's so much more control around it that, you know, one part of the book talks about how, you know, best intentioned parents say there's a problem at school. How many times, I mean, I'm going to, raise my hand here. Have you jumped in, emailed a teacher or the principal or something to handle the situation? What you're suggesting too is like, maybe just allow the kids to handle the situation. And and just in general, we need to do that as parents a lot more than we are as a generation. Absolutely. And I am so guilty of it myself. I mean, I am a reformed, I guess, maybe quote unquote, in, intensive parent or helicopter parent. So I've been there, done that. And I still struggle with it because I think in our achievement culture today, which is very high stakes, high pressure, the consequences feel really, really high. So I know parents listening to this are probably thinking, well, if I don't, this bad thing is going to happen or potentially can happen. And I think that's the hardest thing for parents is it may not even feel good good to intervene and send that email or go to the school or talk to the teacher. But we just feel like we have to, like it's our responsibility to make sure everything is okay for our kids. And that's a lot of what's backfiring today. You mentioned achievement culture. And I think this is a, an important part to kind of hit on. There is so much, not just from home, there is so much pressure on kids to specialize in a sport by age five or make sure they're taking all the AP courses that they possibly can in high school. But beyond just the courses, what are you doing to better the community? Because that's really what you need in order to get into college. Where do we go from here? What advice do you have for parents who, you know, get sucked in to that as well. They ultimately we want what is best for our kids. I mean, again, I'll admit, like we we push our children academically. We do because we want them to get into the best schools and have the brightest possible future. So, what advice do you have for parents to still push your child to reach their ultimate potential? but enough to back off where they can do it on their own. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. 
Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. I have given this so much thought because I think it is the most critical thing that we can be thinking about, but it's also the most challenging because like you said, we're, we are in an achievement culture and a culture, it, it's like being a fish in water. You're not even aware of the influence it's having on how you're thinking about and what you're talking about. And so it, it's really pushing us in ways that we're not even aware that we're doing. So an example of that would be one of the things I commonly hear from students is um, my parents care more about my grades than they do me. And mm -hmm. that is, I have never found a case where that is true. However, I do think that the kids really do feel that way. And over the years, what I've, what I've come to realize is they think that because their brain is just a little stat machine and it's saying, okay, the thing my parent talks to me most about are academics and school related things. So that must be what they care about. And, you know, parents, I think we don't realize how often we are talking to our kids about school stuff and achievement and the checking, you know, is this done? Did you do that? Have you talked to the teacher? And I, I think that's part of the issue. So as parents, one of the things we can first do is just take time to pay attention to that kind of thing. Like how much are we focusing on school? And start to have conversations with your kid about that. I actually have a tool on my website, which maybe you can link to, which can help parents start that process of figuring out how often they're talking about academics. Um, but the other thing that parents can do, because I was trying to figure out, well, how do we change the achievement culture? And I came to realize, whoa, that's a big ask because there's a lot of working parts there. So what can we control? We can control what happens in our own family. And for me, that looks like sitting down with your kid, particularly once they get into maybe upper elementary, middle school, high school, and just having conversations about what are the expectations. So acknowledging, wow, our school district pays a lot of attention to this and puts a lot of value on, you know, getting into college X or taking the APs or whatever it is. And that's one definition of success. What is success for you? and for us and our family. Mm -hmm. So it's child by child. So if you have a kid who's just, you know, super creative, maybe they have, maybe they have some neurodivergence in their thinking and, you know, they're awesome kids, but school is not there. It, it's just not the place where they shine. Then the expectations, it's, it's hard for that kid who is swimming upstream to meet these really high expectation of taking all the APs and getting a really high GPA. So reevaluating, well, what does success look like for you? I think you're going to end up with a child who has a lot more potential to be successful than a child who's been swimming upstream hmm. year after year after year in school. You talk about the um, achievement culture, I can't help but wonder how social media just plays a role in that. There, it's, just, it's not just achievement culture, it's comparison culture that we're living in. I also think with social media, there's a sense of loneliness that we have these virtual friends, and you talk about this on, in your book too, but I've, I noticed it uh, back when Facebook was really taking off that I ended up being connected with people online, like friends that I would normally call for like a quick update because I hadn't talked to them in six months. Well, now I was already connected to them, kind of saw the latest pictures of the kids, know they went on a vacation. So stopped having those sort of regular check-ins with friends. And kids today, that's really the only world that they know. Yeah. And I do think that's contributing to, you know, the mental health crisis we're seeing, because I think there is a lot of loneliness and there are opportunities for kids. I mean, I think social media has a lot of wonderful 
benefits to it and used the right way. It can be really beneficial to our kids, but we, especially kids who are vulnerable, it can, it can be really devastating because then you add that piece into all the stressors around school. And that's why we have kids who are, you know, looking for alternative (laughs) placements and it, it becomes a real issue. I want to talk a little bit more about parenting because there was a page in your book. It's page 71. I remember specifically because I read it out loud to my husband and I was like, I think we're getting played. Uh, <laughs> so I, I want to um, just read this to for, for our listeners to see if they can identify with this. And it starts with the part under helping and support. And Often we feel like we're helping and supporting, but really it's having the opposite effect. So it starts with, how many times has something like this happened in your house? You, hey, please empty the dishwasher after dinner. Child, I can't. I have homework to do and I'm way behind. I'm really stressed right now. And for added emphasis, they start to give off that unmistakable vibe of fraying at the edges. Clearly one more word from us will be their undoing. So what do we do? All too often, we cave and empty the dishwasher ourselves. Then we ask, what else can we do to help them out? Oh my gosh, that was like, felt so personal. Mm. Yeah, me too. I I mean, I I don't (laughs) know a parent who hasn't done that. But that's not actually helping at all building that resilience that we really need most of all for our kids right now. Yeah, we're, we're as parents, we're protecting our comfort. I think in general, we're all very uncomfortable being uncomfortable. So Mm -hmm. it is easier for us not to have the fight. And it's easier for us to not upset our children. So in, in, many situations throughout the day, it is just the easier way to go. And, and, and I think of it as part of it is we're, there's a fear associated with pushing. Totally. You know, how far can I push before they're going to, you know, lose yep. it? <laughs> um, but the problem is at some point our kids go off and usually it's, you know, post you know, high school, they go off to college or do a gap year or get a job or whatever it is, but they become more independent. And if they haven't experienced enough discomfort and had enough opportunity to fall on their face, fall apart, do things wrong, have to make amends, all of those kinds of things that I think maybe you and I experienced growing up fairly often. I mean, I know my biggest lessons in life have come from making some big mistakes. And we try very hard to protect our kids from making Mm -hmm. those big mistakes. And adulthood becomes extremely daunting for someone who doesn't have a lot of time in that arena. So that's why I think we tend to look at our kids and think they're not quite as resilient and they fall apart too quickly and that kind of stuff. So as parents, as hard as it is, our well-intentioned helping often does backfire. And that's not to say that you can't help help out a family member or anybody, but it's it's more to say that that should not be our go-to all the time, that we have to have higher expectations for our kids and give them a lot more credit and trust them like in our guts more than we do because we, again, we're so conditioned to worry about the consequences. Can't help but feel like maybe part of it too might be overcompensation. I mean, we grew up in a much different time, uh, latchkey kids coming home where, you know, nobody's home. I, I remember feeling a lot of aloneness as a kid and, I, you know, maybe it's, I don't want my children to ever feel like that. So there's probably, there is overcompensating, I think, probably when it comes to all of this. Probably. And, and that aloneness though, you had to navigate that without a cell phone. Sure. (laughs) Which can you imagine rolling? Could you imagine our children doing that today? No. I mean, I, I, it would be catastrophic because that is not what they've come accustomed to. Sometimes I hear parents say, well, they just need to, you know, 
I did it this way, they can do it this way. And everything is just so different. It really is different for Mm -hmm. our kids today. It's harder. There's so much coming at, there's no simplicity Mm -mm. to it. There is no boredom. There, there is no, you don't have to be bored. You grab, grab your cell phone or your tablet or whatever. There's no, just like go outside and find something to do. I mean, we say that to our kids and they like 20 minutes later, they're like, can we come in now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, torture. I mean, there, we could go in so many different directions. And like I said, I, I mean, I, I highly recommend the, this book for any parent. It's just, it's a parenting book, whether you have the disintegrating student is if you as you've coined that phrase or not but back to these these students who you know the so-called smart kids who are really falling apart in the upper grade levels if you were to have one piece of advice for parents of these kids what would it be connection hmm. it, it that the number one piece of advice i have would be to focus on valuing your relationship with your child over their academics. Because I think that's the beginning of all the good things. Because without that, we're not understanding what's happening with each other. So for from a parenting side, the things that put in the book and that I think are really important are things like, you know, active listening. So we're really trying to listen to our kids and push down that urge to problem solve because so often our kids will be upset or they'll come to us and our first urge is like, oh, uh, did you do this? Or uh, let me call or let me do. And we and it's so well-intentioned. We love them. We don't want them to be in this situation. But we're oftentimes, and my daughter would just do this to me. She would say, mom, stop. I just want you to listen. Mm. And so we had a, a code where she would just raise up her hand like this because my go-to I'm a coach. My go-to is problem solving. So we had this little signal that would stop me and that would signal me, oh, I need to listen right now. And when you listen, it's not listening to be defensive or to problem solve. It's to listen, to understand and be empathetic, get get in there, you know, out of our middle-aged brain into their adolescent brain and see it from Mm -hmm. their point of view. Because it might sound kind of silly or trivial to us, but it's not to them. And if we can go there with them and say, oh, wow, that really sounds like that was hard for you. Uh, yes. You know, and that's the kind of that right there connection has been built. And we want more and more of that. And, you know, so listening without being defensive, without being judgmental, really, really hard to do and actually impossible to do all the time. But I think our goal is just we try to get a little bit better at it. And for me, that was telling my kids, hey, I'm trying to do this. Help me. Give me feedback. And that was really beneficial because, again, fear is a very strong emotion. So when we're doing this stuff, when we're helping that's maybe not helping, we're doing it usually out of fear. Hmm. Yeah, that's so true. And connection to some. In fact, a lot of times that's easier said than done, particularly with teenagers who Mm -hmm. don't always want connection. But I'm hardly the expert here, but it's just more of just trying and trying again and trying again, Mm -hmm. right? And the more often we try, the so if we're in more of that, I'm in the problem solving mode, I'm going to go into lecture pretty quickly about something. Our teenagers in particular, they don't want any part of it. So it's easier mm. for them to avoid. So we have to kind of bring... So that's why my 16-year-old... Well, they, they're like, I know what you're going to say. I know what you're going to yeah, say. Yeah, I know. I know. And they do. I is, try to stop myself. Yeah. And it's so interesting because they actually do know what we're going to say. And a lot of times it's yeah. like, okay, well, if that's the case, why... Aren't you doing it? So that's feedback to us, really. If we think about it, it's not working, just saying the things. So Mm. approaching it in this other way of sort of being on their team, you know, really thinking about it solidly. We're in this together. You're experiencing it. Let me, let me get to your level here and experience it with you. And then how can I help? I heard, um, uh, Lisa Damore, she's, uh, she's kind of in this space too. And she said, how can I help in this situation that won't make things worse? And mm. I think that's just such a brilliant there you go. way to ask our kids because they can tell us, okay, I need you not to do this or 
I just want you to sit here just quietly with me while I'm upset. And as a parent, that might not feel like we're doing very much, but if that's what our kid really needs to feel the love and support, which is the most protective factor we can offer as parents to our kids regarding their mental health, I'm, I'm there all day long. Amen. For sure. Dr. Janot, thank you so much. Uh, I want to mention we will have a link to the book and additional resources on our website, wgme.com slash raising me. Really appreciate your insight and the conversation today. Thank you so much for having me. I am telling you, I had so many takeaways from this conversation and the book. For one, simply acknowledging the impact that taking control of situations can have. You know, like the playdate example. And don't get me wrong, because playdates are awesome. They were a major part of my oldest two kids' experience because we really didn't have children in their age group in our neighborhood. So we had to be intentional about socializing and developing friendships. But as Dr. Janot explained, with that does come the risk of not allowing kids to learn to hash things out on their own when a parent is always nearby ready to swoop in. Or, you know, maybe can we take a step back before jumping in and calling school if there's some kind of issue or problem that really our kids can handle or at least get the shot to handle on their own. And that whole part about protecting our comfort, well, whoa, like majorly guilty here so often, come on. It is easier to not have the fight or get the attitude and just do something yourself. Unload the dishwasher, feed the dog, put away the laundry. Yeah, I mean, it could be anything. And I am leaving with the promise of connection with active listening, pushing down that desire to problem solve. It is so hard, but maybe just maybe get a little better each and every time our kids open up to us. Thank you for listening to Raising Me. I'm Adrienne Stein. This episode is edited by Megan Littlefield and produced with Nate Eldridge. If you have a topic you'd like us to take on, we'd love to hear about it. Email us, raisingme at wgme.com and be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts too. Wherever you are, I hope you learned something new and get to take a little time for you.